Hi, I'm Jack Baker, and with this video I want to provide a very brief introduction to ground motion models. Uh, this content will be taken from chapter 4 of the book referenced at the bottom of the slide here. Okay, so as motivation, we've uh, previously talked about um, seismic source modeling, where we've tried to identify the types of ruptures that could occur in the area surrounding our site of interest. Now, for a given earthquake rupture, we need to predict the intensity of ground shaking that would occur at our location of interest. And so I want to provide um, some background on the form of these predictive models and some basic introduction to how we come up with these models. Okay, so the first idea we need to talk about is ground shaking intensity. Um, and so over on the right here, I've got plotted some time series of accelerations recorded from earthquake ground motions. And you've probably seen pictures like this um, where the, you know, the shaking uh, continues and varies in amplitude over um, some period of time and then dies down as the seismic waves pass. So our goal is not going to be to predict an entire time series like this. Um, we just want to predict some metric of ground shaking intensity. Right? And, and whatever metric we pick, uh, we typically refer to that as an intensity measure, or an IM, uh, as an acronym. And that's going to be used then later on to predict the impact of that shaking, too, you know, in terms of uh, damage to a structure or something like that. So some example intensity measures, so peak ground acceleration, uh, so the maximum acceleration that was observed over the duration of shaking or the maximum velocity uh, of the ground over the duration of shaking. Those are kind of relatively intuitive metrics. Spectral acceleration we'll define in just a second. That's a very popular one. Uh, the duration of shaking could be another metric of ground shaking intensity, and so on. I should note briefly in passing, there is another concept of intensity, of macro seismic intensity. Um, that's a little bit of a different issue than, than we're talking about here. So intensity measure or IM is, is as defined on this slide. Okay, let's talk about spectral acceleration for a moment since that's an important uh, tool in engineering seismic hazard analysis. So this metric of ground shaking intensity is the peak response of an elastic oscillator um, with a given period in damping. So maybe we, let's even add that on here. So if I want to have a, an oscillator, I need to specify its stiffness, which is related to a natural period at which it oscillates. And then there's a given amount of damping that dissipates energy in that oscillator as well. And the, so we've got this graphic down below to think about how this works. So we've got kind of A of T is the ground acceleration. So that's, that's what the earthquake produces at the ground. And then we use that as input to this elastic oscillator. And we specify the, the period by T the damping ratio by zeta. And then we've got this differential equation that specifies the, the velocity, displacement, and acceleration of the oscillator as a function of the ground motion input. So there's this differential equation we solve. And then we can look at the relative displacement of the oscillator, which we'll refer to as x of t. So we can, uh, this, is a, this is a time series as well. And then rather than taking that entire time series, we're going to take the maximum value uh, in positive or negative direction of the x of t. And then we can multiply by omega squared to convert that to units of acceleration rather than displacement. So, so more properly, this is called a pseudo spectral acceleration because it's, it's actually computed from displacements. But we typically don't emphasize that um, impact. The spectral acceleration is a function of period, so we, so we denote a t in the argument of it to indicate what period we're looking at. And then um, the damping, we most typically use 5% uh, of critical damping. And so we, we typically don't note that in the notation. Um, so we tend to just note the period. So this is a, um, a nice metric because it um, gives us a sense of the demands that would placed on a, be placed on a structure that oscillates with the same period t. And so we can, by, by intelligently selecting that period t, we can kind of get the aspects of the ground shaking that are most relevant to a, a, a system that would respond with a similar period. That's the idea. It also has units of um, acceleration, which can be easily turned into units of force for things like building code analyses. So that's a very quick look at this metric, um, just since it's so common in ground motion uh, prediction. I want to mention that briefly. There are many other metrics of ground motion intensity we can look at. 
Um, increasingly, we're using Fourier amplitudes of the ground motion and things like that as well. OK, so now we need a ground motion model to predict one of these measures of intensity. And um, so here's the mathematical form. So what I want to do is we want to predict what's the probability that the ground motion intensity measure, I, the IM, like the spectral acceleration, is greater than some threshold that we specify given the rupture conditions, like the magnitude and the source to site distance, and site conditions, um, so the, typically the a measure of the soil conditions at the site, things like that. Okay, And so we are going to compute that as 1 minus the standard normal CDF. So this capital Phi indicates a standard normal CDF. Cumulative distribution function. And in, in the CDF, we're going to specify the, the amplitude threshold that we're, spec that we're interested in. Then we have the mean of the log of the IM values, as predicted by the ground motion model, and the standard deviation of the log of the IM values, as predicted by the ground motion model. So these two parameters, the, the mean and the standard deviation, are predicted by the, the ground motion model. And then you notice all the logarithms in here. So the idea is that the intensity measure is log normally distributed. So when we do all these log transformations, we have normally distributed IM with the mean and standard deviation given by the model. And so then we can use a normal distribution um, to compute the probability of exceeding some threshold. OK, so this is all illustrated graphically down below. And this is some plots of model predictions um, as a function of the source to site distance, which is one of the um, rupture conditions. Or rupture variables. So the solid black line, this is giving us the mean of the log of IM from the ground motion model. So it's predicting kind of smaller mean amplitudes as we increase in distance. A couple notes here, I guess. So, so the vertical axis, this is now spectral acceleration at one second, just to take an illustrative metric. Um, and then I I'm, I'm just mentioned all these log transformations. So rather than plot this in units of, of log IM, which are hard to interpret, what I've got plotted are units of non-log IM on the y-axis, but it's in log scale so that everything kind of still, still works fine. So you see the logarithmic scaling of the y-axis. Okay, And then the dashed black lines, these are, um, let's draw lines to both of them. These are mu log IM plus or minus one standard deviation. And so you can see those, those standard deviations are constant with distance in this case. So they kind of are at a fixed distance above and below. Collectively, that mean and standard deviation defines a normal distribution, again, in log IM space. So I've got kind of normal distributions plotted for a few different uh, distances here. And then this horizontal dashed line um, this is the x value that we're interested in. Right? So if I'm interested in the exceedance of x, I'm interested in kind of how much of the area on the probability distribution is above that x threshold. Right? So as the mean gets bigger, the, there's a higher probability of being able to exceed that x for a rupture uh, with those conditions. Okay? So we need to predict a mean and a standard deviation of these ground motion amplitudes with our ground motion model. That's the takeaway from, from this. And this is the mathematical form that we're going to use um, to do those calculations. OK, so let's, let's talk about example ground motion models. Um, so to illustrate in a relatively transparent manner, I'm going to look at an older ground motion model. This is one by um, Bohr et al., published in 1997, so a couple decades old. The, you see here the, the mean of the, so this is the log. This is a model for spectral acceleration. So the IM is, is spectral acceleration. And standard deviation of log spectral acceleration, those are the two terms we need from the model. And then depending on the period of the spectral acceleration, we're going to have a bunch of coefficients. Um, and those are going to vary depending on the period that we're looking at. So in this case, there's coefficients a0 to a6. So we have seven total coefficients. Um, there's three predictor variables in this model. There's magnitude, a distance, and then a vs30, which is a site condition term. And um, so this is a, a typical way in which these models are set up. So this one is relatively simple because it's an older, um, very early generation one. Um, let's maybe make a note that these, these functional form, and, and generally in these ground motion models, the functional forms are um, motivated by seismological theory. 
Um, and then the coefficients uh, estimated via regression. So we, we use observational data and try to estimate what the coefficients are to, to be able to repredict that observational data. In this case, the solar model, um, we had the authors had 112 observations of ground motions, and they were using those to, to fit these coefficients. Okay? That's the idea here. That's a, you can, so you can, I like this model because you can kind of see what's going on. There's some terms that as the, as the magnitude gets bigger, the, the mean of the log spectral acceleration is going to get bigger. As the distance gets larger, um, the magnitudes are going to get, um, or the amplitudes are going to get smaller. And as the um, VS30 varies, the amplitudes are going to change. Standard deviation is a constant in this case. OK, so that's an older model. Let's, let's um, contrast that with a, a newer model. So here's a model by Cho and Young's in 2014 at the bottom of the slide for comparison. And so you can see there's, there's still a um, log y term. So this is the, the mean of the log of spectral acceleration. It's, it's uh, got a, a y ref term, which is kind of further filled in over here with this uh, long equation here. And then we have a, a standard deviation term. This, so this is the actually the squared standard deviation of log SA. And it also has a much more complicated functional form. So with this newer model, um, there's now 11 predictor variables, uh, extra terms around um, some other factors that we'll talk about in a few slides. There's 45 coefficients in it, a lot, lot more things that have to be tuned. Um, and then because we've collected much more data over the ensuing decades since the 1997 model, this model was calibrated using um, you know, more than 10,000 observations of ground motions. So that's what's driving the ability to fit many more model coefficients. And our, our learning over several decades about the nature of these ground motions have enabled the development of much more complicated functional forms. So this functional form is harder to uh, tease apart and see all the drivers that so you can do it given uh, the time. Um, but I, I like to show that simpler model as motivation of kind of letting you see the essence of these ground motion models. The two models in this case are, are very similar in the, in the outputs that they produce and in the nature of the um, approach that was used to develop them. The, the, the lower model is just much more sophisticated, reflecting our, our greater knowledge and greater data as time passes. Okay, so let's take a look at how these models um, predict things. So uh, let me introduce this uh, figure here. So this is a plot of um, a bunch of observations plotted with dots. Um, and it's we have observations of earthquakes from varying magnitudes. And the magnitudes are plotted on the horizontal axis. The vertical, vertical axis, again, we have a one second spectral acceleration. So these are values measured from ground motion recordings. The uh, orange dots are observations of ground motions that were observed at distances from 80 to 100 kilometers from the rupture. And the blue dots are observations that were taken at um, 10 to 20 kilometers from the rupture, so closer in. So you can see the, the closer in blue dots tend to be stronger in amplitude, though not always. And then you can see the strong positive slope um, from left to right that the, the dots on the right are higher amplitudes. So the larger magnitude earthquakes are producing larger spectral accelerations. OK, also in addition to the dots, we have um, some solid lines, which are predictions from that bohr joiner fumal 1997 model. And then the dashed lines are the predictions from the Cho and Young's 2014 model. So the two models on the previous slide are shown here with predictions. Um, so let's see if a few things we can observe. The, uh, and finally, let me say that the lines are plotted only over the range for which the model was calibrated and claimed to be reasonable. Okay? So, uh, so here's some observations. So at the, at the closer distances, 10 to 20 kilometers, um, and magnitudes from 5.5 to 7.5, here we can... Uh, and it, let me make one more comment so you can uh, follow this. For these model predictions, these were plotted, uh, these were made for you know, the magnitude on the horizontal axis. They were plotted for the mid middle distance between these, so for 15 kilometers and for 90 kilometers, um, were the, the distances used to make the model predictions. And then we made some assumptions about um, other rupture characteristics just to get typical values in here. OK. So uh, from magnitude 5.5 to magnitude 7.5, we see that the, the Bohr um, at all, and the Cho and Young's models are both in very close agreement here about the, the spectral accelerations that would be observed. Um, these closer-in distances, larger magnitude earthquakes, are the ones that were most 
interested in for you know the potential to create strong shaking. Although the Bohr model wasn't able to go all the way up to magnitude eight, the, the newer Cho and Young's model is able to go up to magnitude eight as well. We have some observational data up there nowadays as well. Additionally, the, the Cho and Young's model extends down to much smaller magnitudes as well. Um, and you can see that the, the functional form has to be a little more complicated here. The, the Bohr uh, et al. model is, is just has this linear trend. The Cho and Young's model has kind of a break in the magnitude scaling and has a different slope down here. This uh, extended magnitude range you know, increases the applicability of the model. It also means that we can utilize smaller magnitude data in, to help in the calibration of the model because it's, it fits in there. Okay. And then at the larger distances, you can see that the, the agreement between the two models is not quite as good. Um, and you know, those larger distances weren't, weren't as uh, relevant in the, the very small data set that the Bohr et al. authors used um, 25 years ago. Okay, so, um, so we see we've got these larger amplitudes from larger magnitude ruptures. It's not shown here, but, but large magnitude ruptures also produce longer durations of shaking. Um, and then I should say that there's some frequency dependence in this magnitude scaling. So this is a plot for one second spectral accelerations. If we were to look at shorter period spectral accelerations, the, the slopes of these lines would be a little bit different for um, reasons discussed in the book, but not uh, elaborated on here. Okay, so there's an indication of magnitude scaling and, and starting to understand the way in which these ground motion models kind of fit with the data, right? Uh, both of these models were calibrated to data like this. Um, and additionally, the, those models include standard deviations that would reflect the scatter of the dots uh, around that mean trend that's plotted here as well. Okay, so that's magnitude scaling. Here's a similar plot plotted versus uh, distance. So these are um, kind of, again, a set of observations. And I should note these observations came from the NGA West 2 database of ground motions. So we've got distances from less than 10 kilometers out to 200 kilometers, something like that. Um, We've got uh, orange plot circles here are from large magnitude earthquakes, seven and a half plus or minus a bit. And the blue dots are smaller magnitude earthquakes, five and a half plus or minus a, a bit. So what do we see here? That, so as the distance from the earthquake gets larger, these ground motion amplitudes are decreasing. And that happens uh, for a couple reasons. So one is, is geometric spreading. So as the waves propagate through the earth, um, they're, they're spreading out geometrically, and so the, the amount of energy kind of per volume of the Earth's crust is, is decreasing. And so that's a geometric argument that's uh, relatively uh, straightforward to sort out. There's also anelastic attenuation. So as the waves move up and down and, and create str strains in the crust, the crust is gonna damp out some of that energy as the waves move by. Um, and so the, the um, energy in the waves is dissipating through this damping mechanism. So both of those factors are causing a, a decrease in ground motion amplitudes, and um, the anelastic attenuation is, is related to crustal properties and can be estimated. Geometric spreading can be estimated. And so that motivates the functional form of this distance decay. Over on the left side of the plot, something uh, interesting is that the, the slopes of these models tend to flatten out, reflecting a flattening out of the, the observations as well. So as you get in closer and closer to the source, the ground motion amplitudes don't keep going up. Uh, so that's in part because the earthquake ruptures are finite, and even as you're kind of getting somewhat close to the rupture, you're also getting uh, shaking from other portions of the rupture, and getting closer to any individual point on the rupture doesn't necessarily make put you in a more energetic environment, um, or at least not proportional to um, how much closer you are getting to the fault. So we have this kind of distance saturation that's, that's well-constrained empirically and related to the geometry of the ruptures. Okay, so those types of effects are, are reflected in these ground motion models. You can see a, a kind of a reasonable agreement between the two model predictions in the slide. Um, although we note the, the Bohr et al. model, I believe has a maximum prediction distance of 80 kilometers, where the, the Cho and Young's model goes out to 200 kilometers or, or even more, I believe. Um, so again, you have a broader range of conditions under which the newer models can predict. Okay, so those are magnitude and distance scaling. Those are probably the two most important um, parameters influencing ground motion amplitudes, but there are many other parameters, um, other factors. So um, the next one we would discuss if we were to take a little longer is the site conditions. So the, uh, we're interested in the soil conditions at the location of interest. Um, so softer soils will tend to, um, can, can tend to produce amplification of ground motion amplitudes under some conditions. Um, so we measure that uh, using the shear wave velocity, the velocity at which the waves are traveling through the site um, over the top 30 meters of the soil is, is kind of the standard metric nowadays. Um, 
And another um, site condition that we think about is um, the presence of sedimentary basins. So deep basins of, of softer materials can tend to focus seismic waves, and we have parameters that try to measure that effect. Um, so those are, those are some site conditions. In terms of the rupture, we also think about the style of faulting. So uh, the nature of the movement between uh, at the interface can influence the amplitude of waves and, and ultimate shaking that results from the rupture. Uh, we also think about the geometry of the rupture in terms of its depth, or if we're sitting on kind of one side or the other of an inclined fault. Um, directivity of the rupture, where waves kind of tend to arrive in a synchronized manner, can influence the ground motion intensity and, and, and other metrics as well. So just a quick list here to, to give you an indication that it's not just magnitude and distance, but, but many other factors can influence the, the ground motion intensity. And those are reflected in ground motion models uh, you know, to the extent they're able to, with, again, the modern models having more factors uh, captured in their predictions. OK, so that's a quick uh, look at ground motion models. So some key takeaways here is that these ground motion models, they're going to predict a probability distribution of a ground motion intensity measure, given the characteristics of the rupture in site. So that's where we were talking about the mathematical form. Uh, we generally assume that the ground motion intensity is log normally distributed. And so we need the model to provide us the mean and the standard deviation of the log of the intensity measure as a function of the rupture in the site. And so we, and we looked briefly at a couple functional forms of what those things look like. Most of those models uh, that are in wide use today, they're based on empirically fitting observed ground motions. So we talked about the 100 ground motions or the 10,000 ground motions that were utilized in the two example models there. Uh, the functional forms are motivated by seismological theory. So we have um, reasons to anticipate certain forms of decay and amplitude with distance, as we discussed, for example. Um, increasingly, uh, although I didn't talk about it in this video, numerical simulations of earthquakes are playing a bigger role here. Um, so we can actually numerically simulate an earthquake rupture process and simulate wave propagation through the Earth's crust to try to get at um, you know, predictions of shaking under conditions maybe we don't have great observational evidence from. That can be used both to motivate the functional form of these ground motion models as we talked about here today, um, but it, those simulations can also be used directly just to predict ground motion intensity. So if we uh, produce a suite of, of rupture simulations and wave propagation simulations, we can use that directly to try to infer probability distributions of ground motion intensity. So that's chapter five of the, of the book, uh, not covered here, but I just wanted to mention it briefly for your general awareness that, that that's another technique that's not in widespread use yet today, but is growing uh, quickly in popularity. Okay, so that wraps up our introduction to ground motion modeling.